Hi there, I'm Eric Wordweaver Shervin, Gothi of the Ridgar Folk here in East Texas, and I'd like to welcome you to The Raven's Call. This is a show where I ramble on about different heathen-related subjects, just kind of whatever strikes my fancy, sets my mind on fire at the time. Uh, big UPG warning at the beginning of these, as always. Still get kind of a chuckle on that. People are making a big thing out of my big UPG warning. But anyway, big UPG warning is that this is just my take on heathenry and my take on the world. This is me sharing my worldview out there with you guys. Uh, I am not the end-all be-all authority on anything. Uh, I'm not going to give you the answers on this is how you do it, and if you don't do it like this, you're doing it wrong. Um, it's just not who I am. I'm a very middle-of-the-road guy who is you know, equal parts new growth and roots in tradition. So um, a lot of research, a lot of uh, exploration, a lot of experimentation, a lot of trying new things. Uh, so everything from looking backwards at the past to looking forward to the future, uh, that's kind of my take on heathenry. So, <clears throat> housekeeping stuff. You know the drill, everything's down below. I'm going to assume that you've been to the channel before. If you haven't been to the channel before, please hit subscribe and ding the bell so that you can stay up to date on everything that's going on. We are rapidly approaching 2,000 subscribers. It's kind of crazy. And so I haven't figured out what I'm going to do special for 2,000 subscribers. i got to come up with something. Um, I'll figure it out. <laughs> well, nah, I could come up with something neat. But anyway, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see where that goes. So please, interact with there. Interact down below. You'll see the email, all that fun stuff. It's all in the description down below. If you're listening to the podcast version of this, I try to put that information in the description for the episode as well. I don't do show notes typically, but that stuff's always in there. Link to my book, email, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Do join the Facebook group. I have been told that I am, I, I, I play havoc with the sub, subtitles, closed captions in these uh, in YouTube because I don't have time <laughs> to sit down and do closed captions. I, I just don't. I don't have the time to sit down and enter it all in and, and all that. I just can't. I'm, I'm doing good to get the videos done and get them out there. So, uh, I do not do my own captioning. It's apparently the auto-captioner uh, with YouTube. And, yeah. <laughs> Between the way I speak and the fact that it doesn't understand heathen speak, um, I have heard some really cool things kind of come out of, hey, this is what it said you said. And um, there's been some pretty wild stuff. So if you guys want to, I've got a, a thread up on the Facebook group. You can go in, you can screen cap whatever wild closed captions you see come up and then post them in there and share it out and let's all have a laugh and everything. Who knows, maybe one day I'll pull all those pictures off the thread and put them in a video and share them up here for you guys so you can see just what kind of craziness the caption game is. But eh, it's a thing. It's kind of fun. So... Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's subject. Now, uh, today's subject is a viewer request. Like I said, I take requests, guys. I'm constantly looking at that feedback stuff. I don't always get to reply, but if I see something that's interesting enough that I'm going to make an episode out of it, I will tag it. I will straight up copy and paste it over into this note uh, program that I've got going on my phone where I keep a checklist of show ideas that I'm going to come back to. That way when I come in and I sit down and I, I film, I can run through my list and go, okay, I think I've got time to tackle this one today and this one. Or I'm, I think I've got to do more prep for this one so I'm not really ready for that. Uh, that kind of thing. And so I do take these requests. I love getting these requests because I love getting you guys involved and I love uh, being able to answer your questions because a lot of times you'll ask questions that are really good questions. They're just a little bit more complicated than I can answer briefly in a, a chat bubble or in text. Um, it, sometimes it needs a full episode to expand on. And then sometimes I just feel like talking about it because I think more people need to hear it and see it than would just see the comment, even though maybe I could handle it in a comment. Um, I still think more people need to hear it and share it out kind of thing. So please, um, send in your requests. <laughs> I do check my emails. I check the, uh, the Facebook groups. I check all of it. So wherever you want to contact me, tag me in something, hit me up. I will look at it and see if it fits. <laughs> if it doesn't fit, well, it's not going to make the cut. But if it does, it's an episode. Now, 
on to today's subject. Today's is a viewer request, like I was saying before, and uh, this is submitted by Wold Whitestag. Uh, it was on the Facebook page, and he asked me, hey, what is your take on open air cremations? Funeral pyres, for lack of a, well, straight up, that's what it is, a funeral pyre. What is your take on funeral pyres? And then he said, of course, my understanding is that the only place that it was legal, at least the last time he checked, uh, was in Crestone, Colorado. And update what I checked this morning uh, just to see, and it still seems that Crestone is the only place where uh, outside open air uh, cremations are is still legal in the States, as far as the United States. I don't know about in Europe. I don't know about Australia and all that stuff. You guys can tell me uh, if there's uh, places you know of where you can do open air cremations. Um, not that it matters a whole lot to those that are in the States because you can't really easily transfer the body to do that anyway. But anyway, that's kind of beside the point. Let's talk about the actual process and what's going on here. Because <clears throat> the first part of the question is actually the part that is the most interesting. I mean, what's your take on open air cremations? Yeah, uh, where it can be done is kind of a limitation thing, but what's, what's, what's going on here? Okay. Um, if you've not read it, I highly recommend, folks, you go find H.R. Ellis Davidson's The Road to Hell. It's The Road to Hell, single L. Um, she does a fantastic job. Yes, H.R. Ellis Davidson is a she. It's Hilda Roderick Ellis Dash Davidson. Um, she writes under, or has written under numerous different variations of her name, everything from Hilda Davidson to uh, Hilda, Hilda Roderick Ellis to H.R. Ellis, H.R. Ellis Davidson, H.R. Davidson. I've, I've seen it in all those different formats. But anyway, The Road to Hell is a wonderful book. And if you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. I cannot recommend it enough. I consider it to be essential reading because she looks at funerary rites and processions um, from the standpoint of an archaeologist looking back, it's an academic approach. It's not a spiritual approach. It's an academic approach, but an academic approach with a mind to spiritual influences as far as cultural prevalence and why the culture may view things one way or another. She hits a lot of points that are really good, and she's well-versed in Old Norse and Northern European uh, culture and practices. She's written uh, I think Gods and Myths of Northern Europe or Myths and Gods of Northern Europe. I forget. Uh, it's a good intro book, stuff like that. Anything with her name on it, I consider to be a valid source and good, some, good to read for newbies or seasoned heathens alike. Uh, so anything she puts out, I consider to be quality, at least as far as from an academic standpoint goes. It's still up to you to apply religious and cultural context because it's not a heathen writing about heathen stuff. It's an academic writing about heathen stuff. So go go with that as far as you will. But anyway, The Road to Hell covers a very specific set of things. It looks at the progression of funerary rites for archheathens. Uh, I say archheathens, but if specific time periods. I say periods because she does cover a wide array. Heathenry spanned a huge huge chunk of northern european time because um, only the past about thousand years plus uh, has been that heavily christian influenced because um, iceland converted in 1000 and that was close to the end of the northern conversion northern crusades so anyway um this book covers a large time period and shows the progression of different funerary practices in known heathen areas and then influences from syncretism with Christianity etc etc she looks at the archaeological digs and the evidence that we have there and what we can extrapolate from what we have found and then she also goes in and looks at the literary side of things the references and sagas and eddas and things like that to funerary practices and symbolism and things like that that appear to be present, like the actual road to hell, the transition, uh, the physical distance, and the crossing of a body of water, the horseback ride, all of these things that lead up to crossing over into the realm of the dead. That's passing over a barrier. And so it's a fascinating read. I think it would have been even better if 
she had a better understanding of the essence of mound culture and the fullness of what mound culture means, but still she gets it. I mean, there is some mention of mound culture in there and what all goes into it because, and I, I'm getting to a point, I promise, <laughs> because there was a period of time in the earliest days where uh, there's inhumation and incremate, or inhumation and cremation, sorry. Uh, of course, we've talked, cremation is burning of the body, burning of the cadaver, burning of the, the leftovers, the remains. And inhumation is burial of the remains. So you've got both, okay? Because in heathen, arch heathen times, back before the Christianization of Northern Europe, there was a period of both where both were prevalent. It seems to have started off with inhumation being the main thing. Um, there was burial, um, and largely burials did not look like what burials look like today. A lot of the older graves were, especially the simpler graves, were a fairly narrow hole dug into the ground. It wasn't some giant, you know, eight foot long, six foot deep grave like you've come to know them uh, in the modern world. It was a fairly narrow hole and then the body was lowered down in there. The knees would fold up to the chest and the hands were down either by the sides or kind of in wherever they would fold them for lowering the body in there. And the body was buried. So it wasn't the, the coffin kind of thing. It wasn't necessarily uh, the laid out, uh, big showy kind of funeral like what we've come to know. I think some of that may have just been pragmatic that it wasn't really feasible for them to, to dig a huge layout, lay flat grave. Um, it was more efficient to dig a hole and then lower the body in and then cover the body up. But it's extrapolation and it's all guesswork on my part in that respect as to why. But you can, you can extrapolate some whys that would have been appropriate given the time period, limitations of technology and, and just in general, they didn't have the outside cultural influences telling them that the body needs to be laid flat. That's just kind of how they did it. And then that was the culture of it. So for a long time, they rock along with inhumation. And then cremation is introduced. And there's even some overlap with cremation because we don't really, other than literary references, you can't really say um, what the evidence is for uh, cremated bodies and then spreading the remains because there's nothing to find. You know, you can't go through and do uh, cremated body spread remains. Oh, look, here are the grave goods and everything because there's no grave. Um, so spread remains are very difficult to track. And so it's very difficult outside of literary references and just general kind of folkloric influences um, and remnants to be able to see where those practices survived and what might have been more common in that respect. What we do know is that there was a period of time wherein cremation and inhumation were done together. They would actually burn the bodies, they would encapsulate the remains in like an urn or a jar or something like that, and then they would bury that. So they would bury the burned remains. They would both cremate and inhumate the remains. And so there's a lot going on here. There's a lot, lot going on here. And, you know, she does a wonderful job of explaining kind of some of the cultural elements that go into it and um, the time periods, literary, all that stuff. Give it a read. It's context you need in order to have conversations like this because you need to understand that there's more to it than just the scenes from Beowulf uh, or 13th Warrior where you're shoving the boat off and setting it on fire kind of thing. Um, this is... When you're talking about funerary rites, which I've done some videos on funerary rites before. If you haven't looked at them, go back and see. Um, but when you're talking about funerary rites, there's a whole lot going on here from a ritual aspect, a spiritual aspect, religious aspect. All these different elements flow into one. And it serves a very specific purpose. So you've got to ask yourself the whys on the specific elements of the ritual as to whether or not that's necessary and important. Okay? I promise we're coming on around full circle. I've not lost track of the question. I'm actually building towards it. So stick with me.
So when it comes to inhumation or cremation, what we're doing here, okay, the, the essence of the ritual itself is that we are serving as the role of psychopomp. We are trying to assist the spirit of this individual into passing over into the other side. And so we are releasing its bonds to the purely physical realm. Notice I didn't say the profane realm, I said the purely physical realm to release the spirit into the spiritual plane. Um, whether that's an up, a down, a side to side kind of thing, uh, it depends on interpretations. Personally, me, I'm a grave mound kind of guy. I think that the that when we lower the body into the earth, when we break that plane and bring the body to the underworld, we are breaking that permeable membrane and passing into the unknown. And if you followed any of my stuff on any of my any of my videos in the past, you'll know how big I am on permeable membranes and their role in ritual. I think it's extremely important to keep these things in mind that both from a metaphoric level and from an actual uh, mythic parody level, from all these different levels, uh, permeable membranes play a huge role in what we do religiously and spiritually, okay? Religiously and spiritually. We've talked about the psychopomp and the body, the spirit, leaving the physical realm and passing over to the underworld. Now, why do I specify religious and spiritual separately? Because religious deals with our interactions with the gods and goddesses. Spiritual deals with our interaction with the spirit world. The two are different, but they can coincide in that the spiritual world is a creation of the gods. And so you can be a religious person and a spiritual person. It's not one or the other, uh, contrary to a lot of fluffy bunny uh, belief because they think religion's a bad word and it's it's not it's it's not spirituality is just kind of like science it's another way of understanding that which the gods have granted us so the religious elements of honoring the gods and goddesses asking them to bless this individual as they're passed over etc etc um, there are parts of the soul that i think do return to the gods and goddesses that 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 old that spark of divine madness with the anglo-saxons we call the world um sort of anyway <clears throat> it is there's that piece of us that goes back to the gods but for the vast majority the essence of what makes us us a personality or mind everything like that uh, the soul elements that comprise all of that mostly get returned to the earth and to the spirit realm to be for those energies to be recycled and used again in uh, future incarnations i mean it's it's when something dies the body goes into the soil the soil erodes it breaks it down into its key elements and then it reuses that matter the energy from that matter to create new life you know it, it goes to soil and then soil goes to plant plant goes to animal animal goes to carnivore <clears throat> cycle continues you know it's the same thing, but on a spiritual level. I do think that the spiritual energies cycle and rotate very similarly to the physical energies that we see. Um, that's my take. Take it or leave it as you will. But anyway, so the role of a funeral, funeral or any kind of funerary processions, um, the psychopomp role, is to assist the spirit in passing from the physical to the spiritual, to the afterlife, to the underworld, okay? There's a reason a lot of the underworld symbolism is there. So <clears throat> how does a funeral facilitate those things? Well, it does so through pushing the body uh, across a permeable membrane. In this instance, we're either talking about burning the body, which breaks it down to its core elements, uh, releases all of that energy and then it literally goes through cleansing fire and is passed back into its base elements 
the fast way instead of the slow way, which is the, the slow road. So it's kind of a high road, low road kind of thing. Um, both, in, both involve the breakdown of the body and the release of any leftover energies. So all of that comes around to say that cremation and inhumation do the same thing. They really do. Uh, before inhumating the body, you would cleanse the body, uh, perform rituals to ensure that the energies of the body are released and that there's nothing left over that's going to inhabit the body, um, bring up a draug or things like that, um, or tie the spirit to the physical plane and instead of allowing it to pass into the mound to be with the ancestors. Yes, I believe that a vast majority of our recognizable spirit goes into the mound and exists there with our ancestors in the underworld. That's my main, that, that's my point of reference. So as I go through and I talk about the mound, that's what I'm talking about. Um, you know, the Fera may return back to kind of the Vaitir and whatnot, but <clears throat> the, uh, the recognizable part of our soul that makes us kind of who we are, uh, that part goes to sit with the ancestors in, in the underworld, in the mound. So what is my take on open air? Cremation then. Well, open air cremation in the old days was kind of, uh, the funeral pyre was a very personal way to go about doing this. You know, I know I've spent like 20 minutes talking about build up of funerary rites and things like that, but the actual open air cremation element of it is very thematic. It's very showy. And there is a definite benefit to the showy elements of things because you are ritual involves a certain amount of show, a certain amount of investment of attention, psychic energy. Um, the more involved and more engaged people are, the more power the ritual has, the more control you have over certain things. So I do think that open air cremation is probably better in some respects, but not in all respects. The personal touch, the fact that you have the hand in it, that you are involved in the ritual aspects all the way through, ensure a good, clean process, a good, clean ritual. Now, from a pragmatic standpoint of just the dissipation of the body and the release of the spirit to the other side, funeral home cremations do that just fine. There's, there's not a problem with it because they are extremely efficient. They are very, very efficient and there's, not, there's nothing left for the energies to attach to uh, that would keep something tied uh, in a way that you wouldn't want it to be. It's allowed to move on into the mound and make a clean transition. So I think functionally, uh, closed cremations are just as, if not more efficient, because they are contained, there's less contamination if you want the remains to remain pure. You get the chance to spread the ashes where you would like within a ritual format, a release element, or you can inhumate them and pass the remains through the permeable membrane of the Earth's crust into the underworld and still maintain mound culture. You could create a mausoleum type of setup with say like a storm cellar or something like that, or you could just straight up build a mound and uh, you could inter the cremated remains of multiple generations in a mausoleum style setting and, and uh, keep those remains together, which helps those spirits stay connected. Um, you can, you don't have to, uh, but it does, there is much to be said for the proximity elements of, uh, of remains and the tie of the spirit to the body, or at least the body serving as an anchor point, uh, kind of uh, an access point to that spirit within the mound on the other side in the underworld uh, through conducting the conversation through the conduit of the remains, or at least the locale of the remains where the physical elements would have been reincorporated into the environment. Um, that has some mythic parody with Odin and the Volva, how he has to go, he can't just summon a Volva anywhere that he is. He has to go to the underworld and seek out a Volva, raise her corpse, and then make demands of her, make her speak. So there is a conduit of speaking through the corpse of the dead. 
which lends credence to the whole proximal uh, aspect of uh, the you have to be within a certain proximity to be able to access and it, that's a whole whole another video <laughs> whole another video uh, that I'm about to go on a tangent on and I'm not going to do that with this video because we're already getting pretty close to the half hour mark and there's no point in taking that tangent just yet we can come back to it but so what's my take on open air cremations? I think they're great. I think they're fantastic when you can do them. I think the ritual elements of it, um, as far as tribal practice, tribal culture are fantastic. I think it's great. The reason they're not largely done is more pragmatic than anything else. Um, from a legal standpoint, you know, burning the bodies makes it pretty if that's a common practice it would be really easy to cover up things like uh, murders and whatnot because if everybody's burning the bodies then you just burn the body uh, and it doesn't look out of the ordinary as opposed to charred remains being found and you're pretty sure uh, that either it was an accident involving some kind of accelerant or somebody was up to no good so from a legal standpoint i kind of get that sort of it's not like you can't eh, anyway it's a thing but you know <clears throat> from another standpoint uh, most people don't know how to efficiently cremate a body such that remains are completely immolated uh, for the most part uh, they're going to be bones left over and some incomplete burns uh, it won't completely break down to carbon and so those that know what they're doing, yeah, absolutely can efficiently do it and feed it and maintain it. And then some minor bone grindage, perhaps, you can have completely cremated remains. Or you can do the mixture, like in the old days, you can burn the remains and then inter the remnants. And I guarantee you they didn't necessarily have the efficiency to fully cremate the way that our closed uh, cremations at funeral homes are nowadays so I can't help but believe that there would be remnants and bone chunks and things like that but again I'd have to go back and look at what the actual uh, archaeological remains look like look like look like uh, not just read about them because <laughs> that's not something that they would necessarily think about do they grind the bones or do they not um, how efficient and how complete is the cremation you can find references to it so look do your research find out um, I prefer inhumation. No, that's not that's not accurate. I prefer cremation. I, I completely prefer cremation. I prefer cremation with inhumation of the cremated remains, personally. This is my personal approach. Um, because I feel like the cleansing of the body through fire is one of the most efficient ways of releasing energies and ensuring that things pass on the way they're supposed to be. I still feel like the myth... <sighs> I still feel like you have to pass through the permeable membrane and enter the earth uh, to be most efficient as a psychopomp. So I'm not one of those that just wants to scatter ashes to the winds kind of thing, even though you can, and that's fine because the physical body is still going to return to the earth. Um, it's just not as concentrated. Um, so even then, it still isn't bad because it will be reincorporated. It will pass through that permeable membrane and it will do so faster than it would have if you just inhumated the complete body. So I guess if you're seeing me think some of these things out on the air, I don't really see a problem with that. Uh, not at all. I think that uh, it's fine. Um, I think that if you want to be able to have a location that is kind of an epicenter of that person's spirit, though, um, it is nice to be able to have a, a grave to go to. You know, uh, the grave serves as a conduit, a telephone. It's the vulva that old and raises and then puts back <laughs> when he's done. Um, that's that's the telephone receiver. You know, that's the. If you ever see, um, okay, it's like the prison stuff you see on on TV and whatnot, or you've been to prison. Um, plexiglass with the phones you know you're talking across the the plexiglass barrier with your telephones on either side um, you got the, the veil to the spirit world and uh, you each need a way to communicate back and forth and that's kind of what that is that that serves kind of as that phone line between two um, 
in that instance. That's not the only way to go about it, but it is one avenue and is one of the most efficient as far as actually contacting the ancestors. I do not believe that you have to be within proximity of the corpse to access the ancestors. Um, they are tied to this, the folk soul, your spirit of your family. Um, <clears throat> I think you can access them pretty well from everywhere. I just think it's most efficient and most powerful through the grave because that is a direct conduit to that specific ancestor. So anyway, <clears throat> why do I feel like you can access the ancestors from anywhere is because your philia is tied to your orlog, which is, you know, the tie to the ancestral spirit energy. And so you have a conduit there. It's just not as strong as it is if you go directly to the source and make some kind of contact, or if you have another ritual element to call that spiritual energy to you. Again, UPG stuff, this is all me. Other people will have very differing points of view on this, so talk to everybody and figure out what you think, okay? Um, don't let me tell you what's right and wrong. This is just me and my approach. So, in summation, what do I think about open air cremations? I think they're fantastic. I think they're great, and I think they are preferable over most everything else, uh, except for perhaps the subject of efficiency. I think it's almost impossible to have that nowadays. So I think the pragmatic use in the modern era is to lead up to, I like to use funeral home cremation with proper ritual lead up as far as cleansing of the body, uh, releasing the spirit, etc, etc. And then the cremation of the body and then inhumation of the remains to tie them especially to the uh, kind of, if you've got like a family grave area and things like that, and to have a grave, an epicenter, and to facilitate the pr procession through the permeable membrane into the underworld, into the mound. So um, that's kind of my take on things. Again, it's kind of a quick, it's not quick, it's a half hour long, but I ramble. But we had to set the stage a little bit by recapping some of my previous stuff on funerary rites, taking a little bit further, looking at some of the uh, basic whys on some of the mechanics that lead into it. And then I'm able to actually give my opinion piece on open air uh, versus closed cremation versus inhumation. Um, and again, because my preference on it, that my take on it is very built around the why and the mechanic, ritually speaking. And I do think ritually, mechanic wise, it is better. It is the better way because it is the inner yard taking care of the inner yard. Um, I, I think that is the way that it needs to be. Unfortunately, that's not the way that it can be with legalities in the United States these days. So, unless you have, you know, access to the Crestone, Colorado funeral pyre, but <clears throat> that's not, you know, when you, inhumate, when, you, when you cremate somebody on your own land, the land that they will be tied to, <laughs> you know, that's, because part of the spirit, when, when you enter into the mound, part of your spirit becomes a localized Vatir spirit after fashion. A Farah element that returns to the Vatir, that element of you that stays in the woods where he died, or in the house and the property where you where you lived so long and sets up shop after him. You know, there's, there's a bunch of elements that go into it. It's complex, and my views on the afterlife are as complex as my views on the soul complex. So, yeah. Fun and games. So thank you guys. Uh, thank you, Wode, for writing that uh, request in. Uh, I had a lot of fun going over it and talking about it. It was a bit more complicated than just a, hey, yeah, I think they're great, um, simply because I felt like I needed to set some, some groundwork and uh, to establish kind of a train here as to why I felt that way. Um, but I do. I, I completely agree. I think open air cremations are fantastic. I think I wish we were able to do them on a tribal level, on tribal lands and cremate, inhumate, all of that within one tribal place. I, that would be perfect to me. That would be the right way to do it in my eyes. I think we make do with what we've got and there's only so much that we can do given that we have to function in the modern society. So, trade-offs. It is what it is. Um, yeah. That's way that gets into political stuff, and that's a that's a whole different thing. That I don't do politics on the channel for a reason. So, 
Thank you guys for watching. I hope you found this interesting and uh, we will continue to crank these things out as you guys write in requests and suggestions. Not only do I really like the requests and suggestions, a lot of times I will hit a roadblock and uh, because I haven't been a beginner in a long time. So I don't necessarily think about what beginners want to hear or I'll be on different trains and not and I may get on one kind of focus point for a while and not have a tangent to go off on on something else. And when I get on those, it's like I'm solely focused on, you know, mythic parody with this one issue or work has been crazy and I haven't had time to really think about anything in respect to where I could go with the show. I can always pull up a request and go, ready made, here we go, let's do it. And so I love them. I, I they, they are a great lifeline and uh, I love to have your involvement and give you guys what you want to see in these. So please continue to bring me requests, continue to uh, email me and all that stuff. I will do what I can. It is frequently easier for me to give you more in-depth answers if you frame it in a request for the, for a show. Because if you ask me for a specific, hey, I need you, what, what's your take on this in an email? I, it may be months before I get back to you just because that's that shifts priorities because if I've got to do research for it and stuff like that, I'm going to have to do that when I can because uh, I have other priorities that I have to focus on. Uh, being able to throw it into a show and not have to sit down and type out a huge email and stuff, that that's different because you guys know me, I can ramble forever. So just keep that in mind. Show requests are fantastic. Always love them. Please kick them my way. I definitely remember if it, the subtitles did something stupid today if I broke them somehow uh, because <laughs> I don't do them uh, if, if I broke them if I broke their mind and blew them up then please catch a screenshot of it toss it up on the Facebook page and uh, let's have some fun you know anyway thank you guys appreciate you all for watching thank you so much as we approach 2,000 subscribers you guys are amazing I never thought I'd get to that point it's ludicrous to me so hail to you all thank you May your hearth fires burn bright. Ah, sorry, my camera's not wanting to behave this morning. Let's see if I can shore that up. Yeah, I know, this is all silly. I don't know if I'm going to keep this or if I'm going to cut it. Depends on whether or not I have any hiccups in the actual start of the show. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> Make sure everything's in order here. Make sure I'm in order. <clears throat> All right. <sighs> Let's give this a shot. A little bit of Starbucks this morning. Went out. I haven't hit the Starbucks in like months. So, well, it seems like that's probably been a month or so. Hell, it was my birthday this week anyway. Well, not by the time you see this. By the time you see this, it'll have been like two weeks ago. But at the time I filmed it, yeah. Birthday was on Monday. So anyway. Um, <laughs> fun and games. All right. I'm going to peek out my work window here, take a look and see who's walking by, make sure that's not going to be a problem for me here in a minute. And I do not think that it is. So we will rock and roll. Ah, it's this time of year that's just so intense but this is the only place I have to film in my office and I don't think I'm gonna have time to film at the house this weekend so we need to make the office part work so here we go we're live in three two one let's jam today's is <coughs> is a viewer request sorry a little hiccup there <coughs> chance to get a little drink I need a little too much sugar this morning. I don't do sugar ever. And so it might be a little sugar high at the moment. We'll see. All right. <coughs> Let's give this a shot. Three, two, one. Let's jam. 